I'm in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm going to talk a bit about what we've been working on the last few years. It's a, it's a new version of Hadoop called Hops FS. And we're going to talk about how we've engineered it to uh, about 16 times the performance of uh, Apache HDFS on Spotify's workload. So just to give a bit of background how we came about this project. So when Hadoop came out, it's this nice elephant. I would see the analogy as an animal now would be more like Diplodocus. So Diplodocus was the largest ever land mammal. It had the brain the size of a walnut. So it had the smallest brain volume to body size of any animal ever. And that's pretty much where we are in kind of HDFS territory. We have this name node, which is a very small amount of metadata in comparison to the amount of data you have in the system. And that makes your system not particularly smart at some level. So the more metadata you have, you can do different things with it. You can use it to, to do everything from accounting to traceability to auditing and so on, and, and security. OK, so uh, what we wanted to do was, and I, I apologize for this slide in advance, we, we really wanted to redo Hadoop. I know, it's controversial. I thought about it. Anyway, but that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to re-engineer Hadoop from the ground up uh, to, to ch change the metadata layer, and we're going to make it distributed. So just to dis define the problem first, uh, if you're not familiar with HDFS, HDFS is the file system for Hadoop, and there's a layer called the metadata layer, or the namespace, or the name node. It manages the mapping of file names to the blocks which are stored on data nodes. And you have one name node, and it stores all of those mappings in memory on the heap of a Java virtual machine. And then the data nodes store the actual blocks. So you may have up to 5,000 data nodes storing uh, you know, maybe up to 100 petabytes, but you're only going to have 200 gigabytes of metadata pointing to that on the heap of a JVM. The, the limit, the 200 gigabyte limit is, is a practical limit. It's not set in stone. If we somehow improved garbage collection software uh, algorithms, it might increase. But for the moment, it looks to be pretty static. So even if your server is going to one terabyte, two terabytes memory, this limit will stay there until it, garbage collection algorithms improve. The other thing that's not particularly well known in the name node is that there's a single file system uh, lock. So if you want to write a file, only one node can access the name, uh, name node at a time, the metadata in it. So it has single writer, multiple reader concurrency semantics. So what we want to do at HopsFS was handle both of these problems. We want to make the metadata bigger, so we want to scale it out. Scale it out means add servers and, and we'll get more metadata capacity. Uh, the solution I'll talk about is that we put the metadata in an in-memory distributed database and we use stateless name nodes to access that database. And then the second problem we had to solve was how do we change the concurrency semantics of Hadoop so that we can support multiple concurrent writers in our model. So this is our architecture. You can see here we have, it's a drop-in replacement for HDFS. Now we branched at version 2.0.4 alpha, but we did include lots of features since then, like heterogeneous storage and some other ones. Um, but uh, our client is fully compatible with the HDFS client, so you can use a normal HDFS client. We have a HopsFS client. I'll talk about it later on for small files. We have a, a small change there. Uh, but otherwise, you can have multiple name nodes. One of them will be a leader, and they're going to store the metadata in this database at the back end. It's called NDB, or MySQL cluster. I'll talk about it in a minute. And then we have normal data nodes, which pretty much haven't changed compared to HDFS. We just added one RPC to load balance block reports across these name nodes. But otherwise, it's compatible. So the database that we chose, the, 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 we, we did choose one. But you, if you look at this architecture, you can see we have this DAL driver. So you can plug in any database you want. Uh, the reason why we chose this particular database, well, I used to work on the, on the product team 10 years ago. Uh, that was obviously a reason, uh, but it's an open source in-memory database. When you turn on your phone, there's about 70% chance you're using it because it's used by, mostly by the telecom space for these home location registries. Uh, but it, it scales to handle very high write-intensive workloads. So there's some benchmarks with 200 million transactional reads per second on 30 machines. We don't need that many. We don't have that many. But uh, it's a, we call it a, a relational database. So it's a, it's a no shared state relational database that supports read committed transactions, user defined partitioning. And for us, we particularly need cross partition transactions because what we're going to see is that the file system metadata is stored normalized in the database. That means that if you're going to read a path of length seven, you're going to have to read seven rows in the database. And they're going to reside on different transactions or different partitions. So we need transactions that are efficient across partitions. OK, so just a bit, bit more basic background. This is uh, what you would store in the name node. You'll store the, 
here's an inode, it's called the root inode, and then we have an inode called user, it's a directory, and then we have files which are also inodes. This is the kind of metadata that's stored in the database, and we're gonna, we're gonna put it in the database, sorry. And just for reference, uh, we work with Spotify on this, and here's Spotify's HDFS workload. You can see there's a lot of reads, 68% of the file system operations are reads, and there's 9% LS, so listing the contents of a directory. That's something we have to consider quite a lot. So what we tried to do when we map this metadata to the database nodes, to the partitions, we had to have efficient scans on the system. And in particular, we didn't want any scans that went to all the nodes. We wanted scans to go to one particular partition. We call that a pruned index scan because they scale linearly. So full scans don't, so we had to redesign all our queries to, to as far as possible we still will have some few scans, but not on the critical path for these particular operations. Um, okay, so here's what the metadata looks like. We take the inodes and we store them in a table. And I said it's normalized, so we'll have an inode ID, you'll have a pointer to your parent inode ID and the name and the size and the access attributes and so on. Each, if it's a file, it will have a, a number of blocks. So you're gonna have the file inode ID to the block mapping, the size of the block and so on. And then each block will be replicated in, uh, on several nodes. So we'd have the location of the data nodes where this, each individual block is located. So this is most, there's a lot more tables than this, you know, related to, to the replicas that are, if they're over-replicated, under-replicated, corrupted, and so on. But these are the key tables in the system. So if we, if we fill this up with that data, so we have this little root path, the user path, and three files here. If we put that into these tables, what we'll end up with is, you'll see that these different colors map to different partitions on the database. So the partitioning scheme we chose was that all of the inodes, the files, F1, F2, F3, uh, under the same directory will reside on the same partition in the database. And similarly, all of the blocks and replicas under a given file, so if we take F3 here, they're gonna be stored under the same partition. So that means if you do an LS in a directory, it's only gonna to go to one partition, do a B3 scan locally, and then return the results. And this scales pretty much linearly. The same as if you're gonna access an individual file, you're gonna to go to one partition, you read locally, uh, in memory, and then return. Now, to get this to work, we also need to have a leader name node responsible for uh, background, you know, replicating blocks, uh, handling uh, any, any conditions that, that need to be handled globally. And we do this in the database. We don't use Zookeeper. There's no Zookeeper in the platform anywhere. Um, there's a paper about it if you're interested in it. You can read up on it. The second challenge we had was how do we do the concurrency controls? How do we make sure that, that we have multiple writers accessing the, 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 meta, the namespace at the same time? So if this is a namespace here, we have a root inode, we have some subdirectories and some other subdirectories beneath them. What we, what we support are that every, every file system operation will be a transaction. Okay, so transactions can take locks, in this case, on rows, and the rows would be inodes. So we, if, we take, if we want to add a, a new file called D0 here, or directory D0, we lock the parent uh, directory, because we don't want uh, two potential clients to add the same file at the same time. And if for, uh, we're just reading a file like we have down here, then you, you don't need to take a write lock. So you can just take a read lock or a shared lock on that file. So you can have multiple clients reading the same file at the same time concurrently. But the interesting thing here compared to Apache HDFS is that if, for example, you had Apache Hive as a database and you have lots of partitions here, your clients can write all the partitions in parallel. Uh, they don't have to serialize access to, the, uh, to writing to the file system. So there's one other type of lock that, that we needed which was quite special, which is that if you have a subtree which has, contains more uh, inodes that can fit in a transaction. So if you have a million files or 10 million files in the subtree and we need to do something in the subtree, rename it, uh, change the quota, change access control recursively through the directory, then we introduce a special subtree lock. It's an application level lock that we persist to the database and other transactions will uh, respect it. And uh, then we have a protocol for this for how to actually perform those operations. You can read up more in our paper about it if you're interested. So that's, that's the basis of, of, of the, some of the research challenges we had to overcome. I'll just show you some of the figures uh, out of interest. This is about a year and a half old technology. You know, it's a 10 gigabit network, which is nice. The CPUs are not the most modern. Um, but we, used it, we, we performed experiments on Spotify's workload, and I can just give you an idea of, of the kind of numbers you can get out of this. So if you have two database nodes at the back end, 
you can add name nodes. So on the x-axis, we have more name nodes going from 1 to 25. And you can see that we scale quite linearly up to about 10 name nodes. And then the database, two no data, data, database nodes saturate. And we don't get any improved performance. It drops off, actually, with more name nodes. And that performance is about, you can see, about 370,000 operations per second, which is quite good. For a comparison with HDFS, you might say, well, this is interesting, but I'm not Facebook, I'm not uh, Yahoo, I don't need a big cluster. Uh, if you're to install HA HDFS, so highly available HDFS, you'll need an active name node, a standby name node, you'll need your three uh, journal nodes, you'll need your three Zookeeper nodes. Typically, you'd use five servers for that. If you run with five servers, we outperform HDFS. Okay, so we're, we're getting about 85, 90,000 ops per second in Spotify's workload. And uh, if you have a more write-intensive workload, we'll beat them significantly more. So in Spotify's workload, it's about 2% writes, which is not particularly high. Um, it's not untypical for internet companies either. But I guess in future, when you have more Internet of Things workloads, where there's a lot more writing going on relative to reads, uh, then, then that ratio might change. OK, so what happens? This is kind of interesting. You can see we beat them handily as we add name nodes. So HDFS maxes out at about 75, 77,000 ops per second. Um, but we can add more database nodes. I said that the database saturated uh, throughput. So if we added four database nodes, so instead of having two, we go to four, we can see our throughput is increasing. We don't max out at 10 anymore. Around 20, we start to lose uh, throughput. So if we go again to eight database nodes instead of four, we're going to up to over 40, 45. Only at that point, we're already over a million operations per second now. That was a nice feeling to go over a million ops per second in HDFS. Um, and then we went again to 12 database nodes, and we went to over 1.2 million ops per second. So the interesting thing here is that even though we beat them 16 times the throughput, you can scale further if you have more hardware. Um, just for a, a, some of you who are very observant may notice there's a tiny difference between 8 and 12 nodes here. So 8, eight nodes slightly outperforms it. There are some scans in there in that workload. And the more nodes you have, you'll have kind of straggler effects from having more nodes and scans. So we try to reduce scans to an absolute minimum, but there's still going to be a couple performing for some uh, file system operations. OK, so that's the uh, Spotify workload. We, we said, OK, what happens if we have more writes than Spotify had? They have only 2% writes. So if we go to 5% writes, we drop a little bit in performance, but they go from 78,000 to 53. So it's a 22 times faster than them. If we go to 20% writes, we get 37 times faster than HDFS. And again, it's because of this single file system uh, lock, that, where you've only a single writer active at any given time. OK, so that's the, the throughput. So we can say we can build a faster HDFS cluster. That's nice. But what about the amount of metadata? How much metadata can I have in here? Um, and here's a, a very simple kind of guide. We don't have this much memory to test it and run it in production. But uh, the database itself will easily, there are uh, NDB databases with 12 terabytes running now commercially. And uh, in the next version, 7.6, they're going to increase the, the capability to have much larger uh, in-memory databases, so 20, 30 terabytes. So then you can go maybe up to you know, 10,000 uh, file, 10, million hours files, which is what I guess 10 billion files, potentially. So we, we expect that, that you know, th that's where we'll be within a year's time. So the other question is you're saying, well, if you're adding a database, you're going to increase the latency, aren't you? Because instead of going just to the name node and returning, you're going to go to the name node, then go to the database, then come back to the name node, and then return to the client. And for a very small number of concurrent clients, that's true. Um, for under, under 50, under 20, under 10. But pretty quickly, if, as you add more concurrent clients in HDFS, they have to queue, queue up to try and get this uh, global uh, lock. And we did some experiments with 50 clients, and, and HopsFS just started to have lower latency than them. This is on our 10 gigabit network, remember? Uh, up to 1,500 concurrent clients, uh, HDFS's latency starts increasing. Now we're into up to 15 milliseconds average latency. And um, you know, for a larger number of concurrent clients, HDFS has significant latency. Uh, so we're talking up to 60, we measured 67 milliseconds. Now you can have way more concurrent clients than 6, 7,000 on a 5,000 node cluster. You can go to tens of thousands of clients, and then you're going to have significant latency issues. But in HopsFS, it, it increases, but very slowly. So we're still in single-digit latency at this point. 
Okay, so we had 10 times lower latency in, in that particular example. So that, that's the kind of performance figures of HOPSFS, but we've been working on it for a number of years and we've done quite a number of features. One of them is erasure coding. We have uh, taken Facebook of erasure codes for HDFS. We've added the Intel library to it. And uh, this supports data locality. So you may have seen HDFS uh, version 3 and Hadoop version 3. They're introducing erasure coding. Well, they're using a, a technology called striping where you take a block and you split it up and spread it out over many nodes. And uh, then you read from many nodes when you need to read. You will have straggler effects from that, but most importantly, you lose data locality. So you can't send the computation to where the data resides. So in our case, it's based on Facebook's work, and it, it does support data locality. But we, in contrast to Facebook, we do all this in the name node. So we don't do it uh, as they did in an external service from, uh, from the system. And what can you do with that, right? If you have erasure coding, we've done some pretty funky stuff. So we've been running this in production since last summer uh, up in northern Sweden on a, now it's a 54-node no, cluster. Um, but what we do is we, we run ZFS. So we're very interested in ZFS. I think it has some nice properties as a file system. Uh, triple replicated blocks we store in RAID 0. So we take two, two disks and make them RAID 0. So we get nice throughput. Um, this is very important if you have a 10 gigabit network. So if you're, you have a 10 gigabit network and you're a single HDFS client writing to a file on a remote disk, you're going to be bottlenecked on the disk. You'll get about 120, 150 megabytes write speed on the disk, but you get a 10 gigabit network. However, if you run RAID 0 over two disks, you can get nice write, uh, write speeds of 250 megabytes we get and about 350 megabytes in, in reads. Another thing we're doing is uh, we're, we're RAID... We're doing two-level erasure coding. So if you want to do um, erasure coding, you have a big problem, which is that if a disk fails, and let's say you're doing read Solomon with 6.3 or 10.4, or uh, if you have a four terabyte disk and you're doing read Solomon 10.4, you need to read 40 terabytes over the network to repair it. Now, depending on how big your cluster is, that might take a long time, might be very expensive. So there is a solution to this, which is two-level erasure coding. In our case, we're using ZFS to achieve this. So what we do is we run RAID 5 locally on the machine. So you may have six disks, one's a party disk. And if a disk fails, then the RAID array can be rebuilt locally. If you get two disks failing, we need to go up to the, to the network level and do erasure coding, and then we need to read all that data over the network. But in the common failure case, you won't have these network storms that, that you experience currently with, um, uh, with erasure coding. And the other secondary benefit of it is if this is cold data and you don't have a massive number of concurrent clients, you get very high throughput. So we get some very nice uh, read and write figures for because you're striping over the, the six disks. Okay, that's the um, that's the erasure coding aspect. Uh, the database is very nice, right? So if you have a database, it's much nicer than building your own, which is effectively what they did in HDFS. And uh, this particular database, NDB, it gives us a change log. We can we can uh, say that we're interested in events on a particular table, and then th those events get uh, streamed to us. And they get streamed basically once every second. You get a batch of all the changes that were made on the tables you're interested in. And we built a system called ePipe. And what ePipe will do is it can pipe your namespace changes to Elasticsearch, so that you can do free text search for any file in the file system. Uh, we, can, we can notify things like the Hive Metastore to clean. We're going to have a give, show an example later, but we move the Hive Metastore into the database. Um, but to clean up some tables, and the same with Kafka, because we support Kafka in another project, and say, hang on, the project was deleted. Maybe we need to clean up the topics associated with it uh, from Zookeeper. So the, we have this general infrastructure for, um, for metadata. We've, if you have massive meta metadata, what are you going to do with it? And one nice thing you can do is that you can just annotate files with metadata. So we have an API where you can just attach a JSON object to a file or directory. You can remove it. You can have multiple, many of them. And they'll just get exported using ePipe to Elasticsearch. And then you can do this as a way to curate files in your file system. Uh, we have a user interface that allows people to do it. They can design their own schemas. Uh, we, have a, we have a scheme API as well. But the other way of extending metadata, if, you're, if you don't like this API, is you can just go in and write your own tables. You know, this, this system is now tinker friendly. So if you compare it with Apache HDFS, if you, they're highly optimized data structures, very dense code. In our case, you just create tables. Just add tables. You want to make, make sure your metadata is consistent. Well, make sure you do it with transactions. And you want to ensure that the metadata points to actual files or directories, but use foreign keys. And that they'll, they'll guarantee maintain integrity for you. 
So we, we did quite a bit of work on yarn. We've been working on this for a, a number of years, but research being research, some projects are very successful. Uh, and yarn has been uh, more challenging to us. So we've been putting, we put the metadata into the whole cluster state for yarn into the database, and we supported multiple resource trackers, and they were all reading and writing to the data, but we, we couldn't really get the throughput figures um, th that would match yarn. So right now that's uh, going on in the background as kind of a a research activity, but the hops distribution does support yarn. It's two, version 2.7.3, and uh, instead of using Zookeeper as a backend, we're using the database. And one of the things we do, for example, is we do quotas for projects in our in our front end called Hopsworks. So when you allocate containers, when you deallocate containers, we'll increment quotas uh, for projects in there. So that's a nice feature of the database there. Uh, another side effect of that database thing is that it's easy for us to back up all the state. We just back up MySQL cluster and we get all the metadata for these different services. So that with Yarn, actually, there was a, there was a nice talk yesterday uh, by Sanjay on, on where Hadoop's going in version 3. And, and we, we were kind of happy we'd done a little fix for the capacity scheduler. And we, we went from this blue line to this red line here. And he said yesterday, well, we, we've changed uh, the way we're doing scheduling in, in Yarn 3. It's not going to be triggered on node heartbeats and uh, we get 6x the throughput. So our improvements here are maybe not as good as, as the ones that are coming in version 3. But we, we dig down because we were, we were benchmarking our own uh, YARN uh, system and we saw some, I guess, you know, uh, performance issues in there. That like when, when, a, when a, a container is freed, the, the scheduler is informed of this and it will search all of the applications instead of just the ones who are listening for, uh, the ones who are requesting uh, resources. And that, uh, meant that you would drop off in scalability. So this is basically where you could go with hops now. If you want to run a 20,000 node hops cluster, you can, you can do it, pretty much. So hops itself, uh, we, we, we have a distribution, like I said, we have a front end called Hopsworks. There's Elasticsearch in it, there's Logstash, there's TensorFlow. Uh, we have a notebook Zeppelin. We're, we're doing Jupyter right now. And then we have Kibana and um, a couple of others. Grafana as well, of course, InfluxDB. And you can install it pretty easily on, on premise, AWS, or Google Compute. Uh, we have a tool called Carmel, which is an orchestration tool for Chef. So the, there's cookbooks in Chef to install all of this. Uh, you can do it in a UI. You can click your way to a, to a cluster. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but where are we going with this project? So we've been working on this for a number of years as a research project, but we have lots of things going on. We see this as being uh, a new way to build a, a next generation uh, HDFS architecture. So one of the things that we're doing right now, and we have a POC done for it, and we're trying to tighten that up to include it in the distribution, is that if you take Hive's Metastore, and typically the Hive Metastore will be stored in, in a MySQL server, which is a very popular place to store the Hive Metastore data, well, we're running a MySQL server, but not the traditional InnoDB engine. We're using this uh, NDB engine. So we just got the Hive Metastore data store to work with the NDB engine and MySQL, and it works fine. And what we can do is we can put it in the same database that HopsFS is in, and then we can add foreign keys. So what if you have a, if you have a table or a database in Hive, it's going to have a backing directory uh, or file in HDFS. So if you do the following, let's look at our tables in Hive. We've got web sales and website. If I go to the command line in HDFS and remove web sales here, an existing Hive, you're in trouble. Right? Hive won't even check. Hive doesn't even check if the backing file is missing. It'll just go, I don't know, what's going on? Uh, but in our case, it will, it will actually, you just do show tables, it's gone. That's it. Right? HDFS, uh, because we removed uh, the, the, the backing directory and we had a foreign key to the tables in Hive, uh, it all got cleaned up. Now, there's a couple of tables in Hive that don't get, the foreign keys didn't work with we clean them up with um, ePipe. And we also have a utility to run if you, don't, uh, if you don't run ePipe to clean up. But they're just kind of hanging there. Um, that's one thing we're doing. Another thing that's, I guess, even more interesting for many people is you hear all the time about small files, and it's a problem. Uh, this is Spotify. This is some new information here. Uh, Spotify, where do they look like in terms of their file distribution size in, uh, in HDFS? Well, they have 20% of them are, are roughly under four kilobytes. Uh, we have these green lines, Yahoo released, they're about the same. The green lines, there's only a few data points from, from Yahoo, we have more from Spotify. And we also know the percentage of operations roughly on these different file sizes. 
So that's interesting. There's a lot of small files. Okay, what can we do about it? Well, what we can do in, in the database is the database supports what we call on disk columns. So we can store that file in a column on disk in the database. So you, we, we have some SSDs and we, um, we install them uh, on the same nodes as the database nodes. And then we have a, a column which says this is a file. So the way that HFS client works and, and also our client is that you buffer the first 64 kilobytes of a file and then it gets flushed down to the data node. Now, if you close the file before that you've filled that buffer, we just send it to the name node and then it gets put into the, into the database in this on disk column. The next time you go to get block call, get block locations to read the file, you just get the file returned to you. And that's where the HopsFS client gets it immediately. It's just a single round trip. But with the HTFS client, we, we, we have a, a, it's outstanding work we'd have to implement a, a data node API in the name node to basically go to the name node, come back to the HFS client, and then go back to the name node and say, give me this block, you know, which would go to the database. But the advantage of this is, is latency, right? For small files, uh, this is going to be single digit latency to read your small file, um, as opposed to you know, 100 milliseconds or tens of milliseconds at the very uh, fastest for HDFS. So here's a, some figures. These are not peer reviewed, so take them with a grain of salt. Um, but we can see that for reading small files, we didn't actually hit data nodes, so we didn't have enough data nodes to, to, to validate these figures with. But we're getting, the, so you can see the reading of files on Apache HDFS, it's kind of similar number to the reading we were getting earlier on. We're just reading the metadata and assuming that the data nodes can serve out those files in time. Um, but for creating small files, HDFS is very, very slow. Okay, that's big, again because of this single name node lock. And in our case, we, this is only six database nodes. So with six database nodes and six of these SSD disks, uh, we can read 300,000 small files per second. And uh, we can write over 120,000 small files per second. So if you go back to Spotify's workload and we looked at this 1.2 million operations per second, if we put all of the small files in the database and we only had six database nodes, we'd handle it. It could be handled from the, from the database. So this is kind of where we see things going in terms of tiered storage, that small data will come from the name node layer and then larger data from the blocks in HDFS. So another thing we're working on right now, we haven't finished it, we haven't released the PUC, but we have solved some of the hard problems, is can we run HDFS over two availability zones or two different geographic zones and have uh, two replicated copies? So this is going to be the same HDFS if you access it from this data uh, availability zone or from this availability zone on, on the right. So what we're doing is, at the moment, is we have, at the name node level, we've implemented a network partition identification service. Uh, the database supports asynchronous replication, and it also supports conflict detection and resolution. So in this case, the semantics of what we expect to see here is it'll be like Dropbox. So if you see, use Dropbox and you'll see that you know, you're offline, you've changed the file, you come online and somebody else changed the same file, you get conflicted copy. Yeah. So that's what we'll get. So the block, blocks that are allocated on each side will be unique, but the file names, uh, that if you have a network partition, maybe someone creates the same file here as the same file here, we'll rename one of them to conflicted copy. That's the expected behavior. Um, so that's a pretty exciting thing because this is basically saying we can move HDFS to the cloud and make it availability zone, uh, I'm sorry, uh, make it uh, yeah, tolerant to data center failures, effectively. It might be useful for backup if that's interesting for you. So just to, to summarize what I've been going through, this is, we were talking about HOPS, FS, the file system, but also the, the distribution HOPS. It's the only European distribution of Hadoop. And uh, you know, if you're a researcher or if you like playing with things, it's very tinker friendly and it's open source. It's all up on GitHub. And uh, we've made some very interesting performance gains uh, compared to HDFS. <clears throat> so if you're building higher level frameworks, we have some nice properties here that we can export the namespace to Elasticsearch. We support small, we'll support small files soon, strongly consistent uh, metadata. Um, you can build some nice data processing frameworks on top of this, exploiting some of these features as well. And also, not just that, but also um, you know, data auditing and, and data processing platforms. Okay, so it's there's a lot of people involved in this project. Um, that's our Twitter handle up there. Um, you know, we've around 20 people active on it, uh, maybe 10 kind of uh, full-time PhDs, researchers, 
and a bunch of master's students. Uh, we have a company providing commercial support called Logical Clocks, and we have a bunch of users. So we have a bunch of reference customers that are, that are working with us now, mostly in the Swedish area, but we've also some people in Hungary as well, and Egypt. Um, so that's it. Um, I'll take time for questions if, we're, if we have time. Yeah? Uh, uh, you, are, you are not using Zookeeper. Nope. The, if the leader name node fails, uh, then how does it work? Okay, so we have a leader election protocol that runs in the database. So if, if you go back to, if you remember, let me see where we're here. Um, this, is, this is the leader election algorithm. So if you have distributed shared memory and you support transactions, well, that's enough to do leader election. Okay, so we implemented leader election algorithm. You can read up the results of it, but you can see that the time to identify leader failure, we had at around two seconds, up to 300 name nodes. And Zookeeper, you can only really get around five seconds. Um, so that's, how, that's basically how we're doing leader election. So the definition of a live name node is one that can write to the database. If the name node cannot write to the database, it's considered a dead name node. It will then leave the system. It will be evicted. And when it rejoins, then uh, you'll have a new leader. The, the other nodes will notice that, and then they'll elect a new leader. So that will be done by NDP, the backend database? No, with the logic, the algorithm is implemented in the name nodes. But the shared state, so we have a table effectively, right? And each name node will write to a row in the table, and they'll lock the, all the other rows, the other name nodes, write their row and say, I'm writing now with logical time, okay? And then the next time, they'll, they'll increment that logical clock, and uh, that's basically how we're doing leader election. It's more like a group communication protocol, because we can have more information than just who's a leader. We know about the state of all the other new leaders, and we can even add more uh, attributes there if we want to. So it's more like a group communication protocol. We, we, we're doing this for climate science. We have uh, some climate scientists using our platform in Lulio, and we're, we're actually putting the climate science metadata as JSON objects in here. And um, so they have different file formats. Uh, they have large amounts of metadata in them. And uh, that's, we're building Parquet stuff on top of it, but they also read the metadata to, to you know, inform the frameworks for how to process it. But the other people who are using it are genomics people. They're using it quite a lot to annotate their genomics files, and then they use it for free text search to find, you know, I want to find these genomes for the people who have these particular, um, you know, uh, attributes. Yeah. Um, with, uh, with the NDB stuff in particular, um, I'm, now that I'm seeing that the original paper was in 2015, did projects like uh, Apache Geode not exist at the time? Is that the reason there Apache Geode. I'm, yeah, I've heard of it, but I don't know. So, I mean, the, if, you're, if you're alluding, why don't we use Geode instead of NDB? Is that your kind of point? Well, Which, I mean, yeah. Extent. Yeah, we... Mostly just because of the Apache part, I guess. Yeah, well, the, the, the thing is, we have, we have this API, the DAL API. Think of it as being the JDBC API, right? So, you remember the LAMP stack with MySQL and Apache. You can put these together. There's no licensing issues whatsoever, so long as you have the API. So, this is our API, and we have GPL database at the back end. But it's Apache using this API, and then we have a driver, and you can you have to install the driver separately, you know. Yeah. So in our chef code, you just write a line saying I want that NDP driver. Um, but if you you know we had a, did have an implementation in Derby years ago, but it was too much work for us as researchers to maintain it. So we just said, look, uh, we just kept working on that one. Now we had a bunch of database uh, companies approach us since we've uh, published uh, published some of these results and said, "Can you do it for us?" And you know, we don't have resources or bandwidth to do it for other people. And mostly, they've been commercial databases. So this is open source. So then, I guess my question kind of morphed a little bit based on that. What was the initial reasoning for choosing MySQL? So th yeah, the question is, why did we choose MySQL cluster? Uh, firstly, I worked on the team. So I knew the database extremely well, and I knew that we could handle hundreds of million, well, potentially, in our case, the 1.2 million operations per second translated into about 7, 8 million ops per second on the database. So I knew it could handle that with it, not without too much difficulty on commodity hardware. Uh, if you compare it with other databases that claim similar performance figures, you might have Aerospike or 
uh, HStore and some of these other VoltDB. Uh, VoltDB don't do cross-partition transactions, they serialize them, that's useless. Aerospike, no transactions really. Um, there's, you know, there's maybe MemSQL potentially. They support like um, cross-partition transactions and, and, and you need things like localizing your scans to, to one node, like partition prune index scans, and MemDB supports that. So I think there, these are features you find in new, new SQL databases. You know, but you're, if you're going back to your InnoDB or Postgres, it's, you know, it, it won't handle that load. Yeah? Uh, so I've seen that the name node does, uh, I mean, the database behind the name node does asynchronous replication in case of multi-data data center operation or both. Yeah. what happens to the data node in case of partition in between your two data centers? Yeah, so the, the question is, is uh, if we do geo-replication of, of uh, Hops FS, how do we handle data node failures? So what we're doing, I didn't go into any details on this, but what we're currently doing is, um, is that we're synchronously replicating the blocks. So if you, if you write a block to a data node, we're going to write it over. The, we're assuming that there's enough bandwidth on that uh, inter-cluster connection to, to not cause you to block, and then we're writing it back. But let's say we have that partition between the two. Yeah, so what will happen is you'll write these blocks locally, and um, what will happen is then you will write the file locally and it will be available. Um, but when the partition merges, then the name node will see, okay, we don't have enough copies, replicas of this block on the, on the other cluster. Now we need to make a copy from here to there. So okay. So the two replicas of the same uh, FSV sync up after the... Yeah, the partition has merged they'll, they'll, they, the same way they do currently. <laughs> So if you have a block placement policy that says I need to have my blocks on different racks, uh, uh, the name node will fix that, will balance it out for you. Um, so typically the four blocks that we wrote here might not be what you want. You might have three blocks and so on. So, so that means you could probably do that deliberately, only write on one side and return. You could if you want. Then the framework will fix it for you asynchronously. Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, you can. There's different permutations and combinations you can do on this. Um, at the moment, this is the model we're thinking, which is availability zones. Amazon. Uh, if you're thinking off on-prem, you might say, well, okay, this will be geographically replicated, and then in this case, that would be probably preferable. Um, but the one other thing we do have, which is, we we have a demo paper at ICDCS next month, is that we have a peer-to-peer -peer engine for actually replicating data sets or, or groups of files between uh, clusters. And it's using a congestion control protocol that's not TCP. Uh, so it's based on something called LEDBAT. So it's not going to use bandwidth. That, if you're already using bandwidth, it'll back off. But if there's available bandwidth, it'll suck up that bandwidth and, and copy the data out. Um, but I didn't have time to cover it today. Yeah? Um, I um, haven't read the full paper on NDB, so yeah. pardon my ignorance here if this question is easy. Um, but what about the Yeah, so the question is, what is the data integrity of the, the metadata stored in NDB? So NDB data nodes, they synchronize to disk every one second. So every one second, they're going to write their data to disk to a re, uh, an undo and a redo log. And if you get a failure, you could potentially lose, if you, if you got a power failure, you could potentially lose a second of data. Okay. If the whole cluster goes down, the whole cluster, they have a cluster recovery protocol, so there is actually a global checkpointing algorithm that runs every second, which basically says all the transactions should increment their epoch ID. We go to the next epoch, it's, and then they... And that's really why you have the 48-node limit, right? Um, because if you, as you go to larger clusters, it's very hard to implement a global checkpointing protocol. Okay. Thanks very much, and enjoy your trip home. <laughs>